Chickens are here. Should be easier to get them in than this setup because we've got easy access. Coops are all ready. We're ready to go. So, getting the yurts up tomorrow. I'm just going through the top piece and fixing up holes. Two strategies for that small little holes. I'm just gluing down with a sort of multi-bond, almost like silicon, and just putting a patch on them. And then any tears in the seam, I'm just sewing up with my old singer. Picked this up for 100 euros in the UK one time when I was back there. An old industrial sewing machine, beautiful. I've sewn many, many yurts. I used to have a small word of mouth based business making these. These are very large yurts, they're not yurts technically, they're gurs because they have a, a straight roof pole and that exerts pressure out into the wall and we use a five ton metal wire to hold the tops of the carners or wall sections together. Now a, a yurt has a steam bent roof pole which puts the weight down into the wall so along with a reciprocal roof they're the only types of roof that actually put the weight of the roof down into the wall. I love this old sewing machine. The difficulty sewing a yurt with a machine this high is you need long long tables to put all this cloth on and it's heavy this is about 40 kilos of canvas it's 12 ounce rock proof fireproof waterproof canvas which I get from Mitco in Glasgow and it's a very good textile we've had this out for all summer for six years now and pretty simple stuff now these are I'm not the best seam stuff in the world but these are double seams like you have on the side of your jeans and on car hearts you have triple sewing but I'm I'm not pinning this I'm forming this in my hand as I go in the sewing machine so you've got to be quite nimble and quick and that's why it's not perfectly straight I guess a professional professional would do it as fast and much neater at the same time but it does the job and these have lasted up well the reason that they sometimes get little rips is because we have extreme winds here so particularly on the edges you'll get uh, little rips where they're blown up against the wood with extreme force and it's important to get the roof hatches on at the right time here's a little rip for example there but I can patch that one just with the adhesive that's no problem at all We've had them out in the UK for 10 years under trees, which is like the worst possible place for them and no problem. So pretty impressive for a structure made of plants. And these are the bigger ones I've made. Johanna and I made both of these in about a week uh, before we ran the first courses we did in Sweden many years ago before we had the farm. This is where all the gear lives, so we'll be getting this out tomorrow. Here you have your straps for holding in the, the roof. You can see here the roof goes onto the wire in here and then there's a pin in there to ensure it can't pull out. And then it's actually bolted in at the top end. And here are the oak carners, very beautiful knot-free oak that we use for that. So we'll get that out tomorrow and set these up. Just getting the pads uncovered. So that's the teaching yurt, and this is the dining yurt. A lot of amazing learning and unlearning has been happened under this roof over the last five years, and a lot of incredible dinners have, well, incredible meals all round have happened in this yurt. So big day tomorrow, getting these up. That marks a big change in the landscape and a big change in the season. We've got people arriving uh, next Monday and it'll be Tuesday we kick off our farm scale permaculture course Get a sewing machine. They're awesome. And once you've sewn a few hundred <laughs> kilometers
very easy to do things like make trousers or whatever. But it's a nice skill to have. Looks like it was watching them underneath. Have a look under, you can see all their feet sticking up. Just watch the metal, it's sharp. Can you see? I can see what this is. I'm not sleeping. They're not sleeping yet. Where we the one is like that. Yeah. They're up on their roosts. Can you count them? It's not like that. There's many. Hundreds. Like Look dot. at them, they're looking at you. Can you see them looking at you with their little eyes? Cook it again. Do you think they thought it was a chicken? So this time I didn't film the process of getting the birds in. You can see that in a video from about a year ago, I think. But basically one of us was inside and one was passing in crates and then we're quickly emptying the birds. And it works well to bring the crate into the middle of the eggmobile and sort of shoo them into the far end. And that way the door doesn't even need to be closed necessarily. We keep it drawn to with the person outside. But they basically all huddle into that corner. At this point, the birds are very frightened. We've put in water, just a simple waterer like this, that we're filling up regularly and feed. And we've kept them here for the day. We're gonna move them up onto the pasture tomorrow. You'll see, as I open this, they will get flustered and start backing off, probably. If you've gotta be really slow. There's a bunch of them sitting up on their roosts already. But they're getting used to the space. And I think a lot of them will be sleeping on their perches tonight. They naturally found that. But the first time I came and opened it to put the water in, they were really freaked and they crammed into the corners. And you've got to be careful. You remember that video a few years ago where someone didn't open the nest boxes and the birds, we lost 50 birds which costs about, you know, it's about three or four thousand euros of loss of income. It's why we put nets around the nest boxes so they can't get behind them now. That's so cute actually, just seeing them all sitting on their roots. So I've just come up for the third time today to add some more water and just check that they're doing okay. But they seem fine, they're a lot more settled, they're not so freaked out as when I came up earlier. So I think it's going to go really well to move them onto the grass tomorrow and usually it takes two or three days for them to get familiar with coming out same with this lot if i just swing you around here you'll be able to see they're beautiful healthy birds so they're exactly 16 and a half weeks so from knowing that i am able to calculate precisely when eggs will come and that's always handy to know. So a stressful day for the hens, but they're fine, they can deal with that. Important things now are going to be just getting them eased into uh, the actual space and daily moves and getting them back in at night times. And the best way we've ever found to deal with that is to take a little portable light and hang it in the coop sort of 40 minutes before dusk. So it's getting on to 8.39 here. And that will encourage them all to go back in. We've had years where we've crawled underneath and retracted the birds and got them inside. But you see, they're naturally sitting on their roosts. You don't need to train them to sit on their roosts. And you don't, yeah, you don't need to do a lot other than get a, a light on <coughs> so that they can start coming in. See a lot of feathers underneath. The lights may be a little bit bad here, but that's from them getting flustered and 
uh, moving around a lot. But that's just typically the first day while they're, you know, a little bit spooked and getting used to the space. So, yeah, we'll, we'll show you some updates as we go with the birds going, you know, how they progress on a day-to-day -day basis. But very happy we got the birds in uh, pretty quickly, about half an hour. So pretty low stress for them. So I'm off to just fill up the waters and we'll be moving them in the morning and then getting the yurts up ready for the season. What's that, a peacock feather? This little blue tit has been hanging around the mirror all day, flying at the mirror. So it's a big day. Hens are up at the top of nut fields. So this is the first time we're gonna set the nets up and let them out. So we've come up with a trailer with all the gear. 250 meter poultry nets for each egg mobile and then water is here so we'll get this set up now and then we'll open the doors and put feed just outside the doors but I don't expect them to come rushing out for a little while so we're putting out fencing with poultry net because there's so much net down at the bottom it's a little heavy for some folks I always start by putting the corner posts in and we're essentially making two L shapes like this and I walk laying the fence down and then I come around putting it up it's much quicker I can move uh, an egg mobile set up the nets on my own in less than 20 minutes so it's really quick and easy to use if you handle it correctly that means keeping all of these pegs at the same level when you collect it up and again when we take it down we'll put it down first and then walk around picking it up it's much quicker and always using double pegged fencing so that you can put this fence up without actually bending over, which is quite important for ergonomics. Let's just have a look. So when I put this up, I'm walking along and stretching the net with my foot at the bottom to get the bottom tight. And then just blop, putting it in. And then now as I walk along, I'm doing this one-handed obviously, so it's a bit funky, but I can pick the net in my hand without having in theory to bend over should have a camera on my head i'm always stretching the net so you end up with this nice straight top to the to the fence so the tree lanes dictate the width of our paddocks typically nearly everything's between 10 and 12 meters around the farm here we're dictated by the width of this space so we're just getting these laid up up here and we're good to go. So we come back to the beginning, Gustavo, and then we'll put them up from there. So attention to details with these fences is what makes them fast and very effective. But you should be able to deploy and put up a 50 meter fence in two or three minutes. So some feed inside for today. A little bit of feed around the doors. They are not going to be that eager to come out. They're a little bit spooked by their move this morning. But we'll leave it like this and observe them throughout the day. So fences are up, birds are open, feed inside a little bit and feed outside and water inside and outside. And we just leave them to it. I expect by the end of the day one or two might have come out. It's typical. Then we start following a few days behind the cows now. The cows will start moving a bunch faster than these goes. So, energizer's on. Birds are just looking a little curious in this one. In this eggmobile they exit from under. So I can't really see if they're scoping it out, but I don't see any on the steps yet. These birds see the light, so I expect they will come out relatively quicker. And just got to keep an eye out for predators because there are buzzards 
right here sometimes. So we just want to see how that goes. Someone asked about the pollen and whether the massive amounts of pollen that I showed in last video that have turned our market garden beds yellow basically, uh, whether that's a stress response to the drought last year. I would imagine so, I don't know, but I would guess so. <laughs> Look, the cows and calves are giving each other some grooming. Very nice. Great to have the poultry and cows back in the tandem together. Still haven't made our grazing plan officially, which we'll talk about in another video. But yeah, I think the high amount of pollen could well be a stress response right up at the tips of the spruce here. You've got these beautiful deep crimson flowers. And it's just been absolutely wild, the amount of pollen. Like, I've, I've not just been reacting in my nose. I've had, like, big rashes flaring up on my leg, which, I, you know, I generally have very few ailments or issues with anything. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I assume it's something to do with that. I don't know. But even just taking a screen out here just on my phone, within about 30 seconds, it's totally covered in a film. You see, I can wipe it off here. <laughs> it like the everything is just totally thick with pollen it's definitely unusual i definitely feel like sore in my eye all these little ailments that i think are, are my body reacting uh to a slight allergy that i've never experienced before and that, that seems to be the case for a lot of people having allergies that they didn't know they had because of the unprecedented amount of pollen so smoking ham today New picnic benches, little upgrade. Yeah, it's going up. Busy morning ahead. We're gonna make some ham. So this is some of our forest raised pig ham that's been brining with a little bit of sugar, 10% brine. And now we are getting it in here. This is getting very uh, saturated with smoke after all the chickens last year. A lot of fat on these tables, so I'm just basically going to hang these up on the roof and we're going to set the smoker for about 75 degrees and get that started up. There we go. So, hams on with two hooks, I'm trying to get through some of the fascia. We're using alder spawn, not to two millimeters. Put about half the bag in. So, in classical Swedish fashion, we're using birch bark to light the fire. Just a small fire. This place is totally full of fat now. Nicholas was doing a lot of smoked chicken last year. And that's where you get all this residue that's, this is what these plates are for, is collecting the fat. Ideally, I should let this meat hang and dry and develop a pellicle. Basically a dry skin that allows it to soak up the smoke better. But time is of the essence today with the yurts going up and everything else we've got to do. It's delivery day today. So it's always a bit logistical with managing our sun, etc. So, quick fire in here to bring the temperature up. And then we'll let that smoulder away. The hot smoking, so it's cooking it at the same time. The important things are meat is all at the same level. Mm. So we built this specifically for 50 chickens. Yeah. And it's got a old sauna heater so this guy that's been smoking meat for years along the big lake the freaking mm. he does fish smoking mainly but he basically showed us a simple technique and helped us he gave us this heater and we just made it up and it's a way primarily to take like birds that have scratches from the plucker or whatever and just turn them back into a premium and that's hollow in between yeah it's just got a bunch of insulation like rock wall and so what we're doing now is lighting the fire to specifically warm it up 
to save energy on the thermostat because that's using a couple of kilowatts and it ignites this and this will just smolder away we've worked out that it's best to have it in like a little s-shaped curve about a half a bag and that gets the best like you smoking is all about even heat even smoke mm. and if you just have a big pile it will burn hotter at some points and mm. you know so it's to have a little trail seems to be the best we have this one here to stop the door getting burnt and these fat trays are really important so you don't get fat in the fire because that creates really acrid smoke mm. and so they help and what, how does that heater work at the back it's got a thermostat so we've got we can see temperature here so now i've lit the fire i'm going to close it down why does it run off like electric oh, okay I'm closing that down with oxygen still, just to get the temperature going up in there to save electric. And then the electric is uh, here. And I'm going to be plugged in here. And I've lost my little pen mark, but I think it's around here somewhere, 70. But I'm going to leave this with 24 hours, so I'm going to, once it gets to 70, I'll fill with that if I need to. And put a new mark on it. So basically now, once the meat's in and all good, this will, once the fire's like dying down and the temperature's up, I'll close it up completely and then you can't open it again till it's done. And the temperature will drop back down again once the fire goes out and then the element will pick it up. And then my job is just monitoring the temperature. There'll be smoke coming out of here for the next 24 hours. Okay, lovely sunny day. Yeah, it's coming up. So I fixed these up last night and we're now in a position, we're working in pairs, getting the teaching yard up at the same time as getting this uh, eating yard up. So they're just watching what we're doing and then catching up. None of these guys have been putting up yards before, so it's always a little bit of an interesting scenario. But basically once you, we, we assemble the dragon posts and the Tono, the center wheel. You can see this is quite a heavy duty one because it's holding up hundreds of kilos of roof. So we bolt every roof piece in. And then we have six pieces of kana or wall. This is not free oaks, beautiful stuff. I spent about 4,000 euros building these two in about a week and a half with Johanna. And most of that money went on oak for the walls because you want thin lightweight structure that's very strong and this will last a lifetime and then we're just using spruce for the roof poles these get lashed together and then we put in this five ton metal strap that holds the roof beams in and we line everything up with the door here gives us the approximate height and then we just go around wiggling the walls till we get them even height as close as we can all the way around now we're at the point to have a cup of tea and we need all four of us to lift this up and get the first six roof poles in to keep it stable and then it's a two-person job passing up roof poles and what we do with our roof poles because it's such a heavy yurt is we have them like this so there's one on the outside clipping these onto the wire and then a bolt goes through to hold it onto the wire and then we bolt it on in the middle at the top so it can't possibly fall out because these structures want to twist and drop down if they didn't have the um, good support there in the middle. Looking forward to getting these up, it's going to be beautiful. So, up in the tono, basically it takes four of us to lift this thing up because it's so heavy and balance it while we get the first five posts in like this and then it stands up on its own then we get the the posts over the door because they screw in so that secures it and you can see there's not a lot holding it up but that's enough that we can all let go and split back into pairs and we just go around putting these up so in the initial stages you just get five up to hold this heavy structure up in the middle then when you get your door ones lined up then you count round and make sure you've got these poles in the right place. And now we're good to go. So it's coming up for midday. 
I didn't have the fence on, that's a very poor show. It's not such a big risk today with the birds staying in. So I'm just coming up to see if they're edging out at all. They look like they are not. Be a little bit startled still. Great outdoors. Too scary. So I'm just filling up their water. And the same will be for these microgreens. Just got to add sunflower. Just getting rid of seeds, checking the quality of these. And we're learning to bottom water. So we're using the microgreen trays and bottom watering after a couple of days but still got to get this thing dialed in this is how we serve them we're selling about 90 grams uh, for 35 crowns with a mixture of pea radish and sunflower so last of the wood chip this is to finish the old north beds in the last corner of the new north last time they dumped it on the road this time we've got them a little further back and we've been wood chipping here again this is the path that gets us to the wash station <coughs> but it's a smaller amount this time so it shouldn't make too much of a mess and we'll have this moved in the next days She's teaching the other lady how to drive the big truck, so hope she does a good first time. Definitely going better than last time. Beautiful. So it's about 60 cubic meters we'll have put down. And we pay about 400 euros for a 40 cubic meter load. So it's pretty cheap. That's mostly the delivery cost. The actual wood chip is some people thought that we get this wood chip free. We can get wood chip free but not fine graded wood chip like this. We would get the spoils at the bottom of the pile with some dirt mixed in and it's not the nicest. Or it's unsorted and then you have big chunks that you can't lift up with the pitchfork. But this stuff is really much nicer to work with and it compacts down nice to make a really good pathway. But if that's her first time driving, she did a much better job than her colleague. Maybe she should be teaching her colleague how to do. That's perfect. So it's dinner time now. We've got all the yurts up. And we will be moving a lot of stuff around, filling them up tomorrow. So time for cows to move on in the morning. And look, some of the birds are out. And so we're gonna just have a look and see. So this will mean, I expect most of them will go back in themselves, but we will make sure we put in lights tonight to encourage them back in. Hello girls. <laughs> This is what happened last time, too. Consistently, it's been our experience. A lot stay in, but they they get as the sun goes away. They get a little bit more interested in being out. So the bravest girls are out, hiding away under there.
So we come up with lights as it gets dusky, maybe 8.30. And we'll put the lights in there to encourage them to come back in. This has been our experience the last couple of years where they will be inside very timid all day and then in the evening when the sun sort of dips behind the trees they'll come out and start wandering around. It'll be a few days till they start streaming out like you see in the start of the video, the little intro there, but then that becomes this river of chickens every morning. It's very lovely to see. I think that's it for me. I've got to take care of our son Ragnar now, so I'm signing off. Very nice to have birds on the pasture again and new chicks arriving in a few days into the brooder and we've got the yurts up so it's great we're really on target now for inviting people to the farm and getting underway with one of our renowned farm scale permaculture design trainings which is a, has been the starting point for many people in this journey a great epic overview going deep into all aspects of regenerative land-based and enterprise design managed holistically so stay tuned don't forget to hit subscribe like the videos if you enjoyed them and we'll see you in the next video Thank you.